All right, nuclear fission. All right, what's going on there? You probably know it as splitting the atom, and it's what's going on up the road. Power plant. Okay, the nuclear power plant we have just five miles away. Um, if it were three miles away, we three mile island. Well, we are in Pennsylvania, so you know, it's close to three miles. All right. Now look, at what I'm going to tell you about today is the chemistry behind, the nuclear chemistry behind what's going on in fission. It's not exactly what you think. You might think to yourself, okay, fission is going to break up. I'm going to break a, an atom up. Emily, look here. I'm going to break an atom up, and it's, so I'm going to hit it with something real hard. And they, you know, they actually tried that. It doesn't really work very well. Okay, it turns out you have to do something else to it. Okay? Uh, this little first video here is going to show you like uh, what's going on here. I like it because it's got cool music, and um, yeah, you'll like it too. Uh, hold on a second. You. Right. Now, this first video is going to show you what's going on at the nuclear level. Uh, first, it's going to talk about trying to split the atom by firing alpha particles at it. What's an alpha particle? A helium nucleus, right? So it makes sense, hey, I can hit that with this problem. But it didn't work because alpha particles are positively charged and the nucleuses of the other atoms are positively charged. So it turns out something else worked better, as you'll see. And the music gets all excited. Okay, turn that light off for me? No, yeah, yeah. I think for this one you have to have light off. Let me see. Put the light on. Let me see if there's any better. Alpha particles consist of two protons and two neutrons. Yeah, they carry a positive electric charge. The theory was that by smashing these particles at the nucleus, they might blast it apart, converting some of the mass into energy. Because the nucleus of the target atom is also positively charged, just as magnets can repel each other, the identical positive charges of the nucleus and alpha particle would also repel each other. It was this clash of electrical charge that was preventing the alpha particle from blasting apart the nucleus. The neutron is a subatomic particle just a quarter of the mass of an alpha particle. And it has no electric charge. Our hero. So another reason that if a neutron could be fired at an atom's nucleus, it would not be repelled. Instead, it might bond to the nucleus itself, and then the nucleus would become very unstable. It might then split, and as it did so, it could release some of its vast store of energy, according to E equals mc squared. Zillard calculated that if you hit an atom with a neutron, as the atom divided, it would release not just energy, but two or three more neutrons. And those neutrons might then be free to break apart further atoms. And every time that happened, a tiny bit of mass could be converted into a vast amount of energy. Energy that at every step in the chain would multiply and multiply. It was a chain reaction. All right. Now, a chain reaction. That's what I want to try to get across to you over the next uh, couple of little slides here and uh, little animation. Actually, the next couple of things are little demonstrations, okay? But basically, that's what's happening in nuclear fission. You have an atom. Nuclear fission? Can I get it? Nuclear fission? <laughs> nuclear fission? Okay, we have an atom uh, uh, that's splitting, okay? And a guy, not all atoms, I mean, are, are as good at this as others. Some are better at it than others. Some give off more energy when they drop to a stable state. And uh, it turns out that uranium-235 happens to do it very well. Uranium-235 is one of the two isotopes of uranium that we find commonly in nature. Okay, it's not a very predominant one, though. As a matter of fact, most of uranium is just uranium-238, which is not very fissile. It's fissionable. You can break it up, but it doesn't give off as much energy as uranium-235 and continue the chain going and become a chain reaction. Not as well, anyway.
Now, the key to this, and I've got a picture for you. I'm going to give you this paper probably, well, maybe at the end of the day today, but uh, definitely by, uh, there's some other pictures on here that have to do with some other stuff. I have the picture right up here. I'm going to be showing it to you. Uh, I don't really need to give you this picture today. When we talk about health effects of radiation, I'll probably give you that uh, the same thing because it's at the top of this one, but the other two are actually health ones. So uh, either way, here's what's going on. Okay, take a look. Here's my uranium nucleus. You don't have to copy this. You, me. you will get these. You will get this exact same graph in a, in a couple of days. Now you might think to break this thing up, the more energy I hit it with, with some big particle, it's going to break it up. But it doesn't work that way. As a matter of fact, even the neutron, I need to slow it down more so it can be captured by the nucleus. I don't want something hitting it and bouncing off. I don't want something, uh, you know, I want it to be actually captured by the nucleus. So it has to be a slow moving neutron uh, for a uranium-235 nucleus. And it will capture that. Once it does, it becomes inherently unstable and immediately breaks apart, gives off energy. Okay? You see that? That was kind of cool. That was my little animation. So the energy is given off, but not just energy. Two more neutrons are given off. Unfortunately, they're given off at a very high speed. So it turns out that if I do, if I just throw some uranium together and uh, a neutron is given off, I don't really get a chain reaction. I've got to have something else happening here, especially with the uranium percentage of uranium we have up at the power plant, which is only about 3% uranium-235. Okay, if you get weapons grade uranium, it's a little different. Uh, it's around 90% uranium-235. But the uranium you have in a power plant uh, up here, okay, uranium, most any power plant that uses uranium, uh, the light water reactors and uh, boiling water reactors, pressurized water reactors, these guys have to have a way to slow these neutrons down, all right, so that they can be captured by the next guy. And they do. Turns out water is an excellent moderator. It's called a moderator because these fast moving neutrons aren't going to be very good at, at be, being absorbed by a, another nucleus. So they have to kind of bounce around amongst the water molecules, and the hydrogen in the water molecules tends to you know, slow these neutrons down. And when it does, so once they get slowed down, they can be captured by another uranium-235, which will then split again, give off two more, and so it kind of is a chain reaction. Now, if I let that all happen out of control, I'll get an explosion. But what we do up at the power plant is we control it so that we just get heat off of it. All right, and I'll tell you what that heat goes to do tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to talk about how the um, you know heat is used to generate uh, the heat that's generated is used to boil water basically. All right, and then to drive a turbine, a turbine which is uh, you know steam it generates steam and drive a turbine which generates electricity. All right, so we'll talk about that tomorrow. But today we're on the chemistry only, and so basically. This process is used in the generation of nuclear power and, of course, in weapons, nuclear weapons. <laughs> it's a chain reaction. A another way to look at this chain reaction, another uh, little um, video clips here, two of them. I've seen people do this. I've seen classes do this, actually, but it's a, it seems to me like a waste of time. They bought, you know, hundreds of mouse traps. Okay, laid them out all across the lab in the back, and each mouse trap they put on two ping pong balls. Okay, and they're all laid out, sprung, ready to be sprung. Right? What's going to happen if I throw in one neutron, one ping pong ball? What's going to happen to that those traps? Well, you hit one trap. Shoots off each of those two ping pong balls. It's another trap, which shoots off two more and two more. And it looks kind of like you'll see here, because this is the same basic idea. Pretty soon it's out of control, right? I watch it in slow motion. Same basic idea. Instead of mouse traps, they have little puffs of air underneath this. Watch the first uh, neutron come in here, the first ping pong ball come in. It hits somebody, and it, those two neutrons go off, and then they land, hit two more, and then two more, and two more. Not every one of them happens to get hit, but eventually enough do that you eventually have all this that happens. Okay? Here's another way of looking at it. All right, here's this is actually from a commercial. Electric co-ops don't just generate power. And that's what I was talking about before. Ideas. You can see they you set up ping pong balls on mouse traps all over this gymnasium. You never stop thinking of okay. ways to help everyone be more energy efficient. New technologies to improve reliability. Opportunities. It's not about the commercial. It's about the. You know, a single idea can spark hundreds. 
with all those ideas coming into contact, we can create solutions to whatever challenges come that's our way. That's pretty cool. And that's what's going on. Only because you have a chain reaction, because you, as, as each one of the uranium nuclei is broken apart, it doesn't just give off energy. It gives off neutrons. And those neutrons go and hit more uranium atoms, and they give off neutrons and energy. And each time, a little bit of energy is given off, too. Now, remember I was telling you about uranium. We're going to talk more about this starting tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be all about nuclear power plants. Then, you have a double tomorrow? Second half of tomorrow. Second half of tomorrow, you're going to have actually um, starting your projects. I'll talk about those in a little bit. All right. So, um, let me just, before I leave this, though, for today. Natural uranium, notice, is over 99% uranium-238, which is kind of useless to us. Not very good at maintaining a reaction as it breaks apart, at maintaining a chain reaction as it breaks apart. But uranium-235 is really good at it. So what you do is you enrich uranium. Notice, like, the purple is uranium-235, or 238. The little red stripe is uranium-235. I can enrich it up to around 3 or 4%, and that's good enough to run our power plant up the road. And most of the power plants. I think there's like 500 power plants across the world, nuclear power plants across the world. America has quite a few. Pennsylvania has like 10, I think, or more. Um, uh, at least 10, I think. Maybe more. I think Pennsylvania has more than any other state in the, in the country of power plants. Um, but anyway, uh, you get up to 3, three to 4%, and that's enough uranium-235 so that you can get this chain reaction going, and you can keep it going, and you can generate more heat than, you know, and, and use it to boil water and generate electricity. Now, what you guys do? Okay, question. If more, uh, if more enrichment is more energy, why don't they use enriched uranium more? Well, there's a. It, it takes energy to enrich and time to enrich the uranium. Let's talk. I was just about to say that. Um, Iran, right now, you've heard of Iran. What are they doing? Right now. Use. Well, that's the so question. Well, exactly. That's what they're, they're, they're enriching uranium. So that's the question. What, why are they enrich, enriching uranium? They, they're saying it's be, they want to make, um, uh, they want to have nuclear power, nuclear power plants. They're sitting on, you know, vast oil reserves, so they have lots of energy. So the question is, do they really need nuclear power? Um, but if they are, they're, they're, they, if they do want to have a nuclear power plant, they have to have centrifuges. Centrifuges take advantage of the fact that uranium-238 is heavier than uranium-235, but it's still a very long, expensive process. So, of course, once you get the 3 to 4 percent and it works, use it. There's no point in enriching it all the way up to 90 percent because it's costing you money to do so. So that would be the answer. However, of course, with, the, with a country like Iran, you know, are we worried about them going, once you have the centrifuges, you can enrich them, you can just keep enriching them. Well, can you enrich them up to 90 percent? And then you've got weapons grade uranium and you can make bombs out of it. All right, and that's the problem. Um, and so basically they're trying to, I mean, there's some kind of a deal in place now, and nobody knows if it's, ever, if it's really going to hold. But basically, it, it, by the way, the centrifuge works very similar. To, remember that spinning centrifuge I had over there for the milk? Very similar to that. All right, obviously it doesn't work. Uh, it's not just uh, a, a spinning around in a liquid phase. It actually has to be a gaseous phase. It's going to take, you have to combine it with the uranium with fluorine. Uranium hexafluoride, and you basically get um, you have to do it. It takes a long time, and, and of course, it's very expensive. And uh, but eventually, you could. Will they go beyond that and enrich it to, the, to um, uranium? You know, ninety percent uranium, which you can use for a bomb. Possibly. I mean, that's what they're worried about. Anyway, okay. Well, let's. Uh, before I, I, I shut off the camera, um, what you're going to do next? Uh, I want to talk about uh, too. Um, you're going to. I, I'm in Chem 2, I'm going to do uh, every chapter, a section, on, you're going to do on your own. Two things that are going to be different in Chem 2, well, what, two of many things will be different in Chem 2. Uh, every chapter I'll have one section you'll do on your own. That's what I'm going to have, kind of get used to that from today. It's just two pages, I'm going to have you read, take your own notes on, and there'll be a question and test. I won't teach it. All right, that will happen in Chem 2 as well in every chapter. And that's to get you used to being able to read and interpret you know, at the college level textbooks. A lot of times you guys don't, have I asked you to read a textbook at all, all year? No, don't ask you to do that. I only use the textbook for homework problems, that's it. So this is a your beginning of that. Now, that doesn't mean we do it to a great extent even in Chem 2. Chem 2, first half of the year is organic, we don't even use it, there. there is no textbook. Second half of the year though, in every chapter I'll have you do one section. So I'm gonna have you do that, and that section is gonna be on nuclear fusion. 
Now, nuclear fusion, I don't want to tell you anything about it. It's up to you to find out about it. It's different, obviously, from nuclear fission. And I don't want to, I want you to figure out what the difference is. I want you to take notes on what that difference is. Okay? So you're going to read pages 569 to 570. And when you do, I want you to take your own notes and put them underneath this Roman numeral 9 here. Okay? And not, not, don't, don't get them out yet. Listen, I'm not done talking. All right? You're going to open up to that. You're going to take your own notes. And I want you to try. This is the difference. So guys, a lot of times I'm going to try to give you a hint right now about, and I'll do this in Chem 2 as well. Matter of fact, there are other things I'm going to do in Chem 2. I'll give you an article. I'll have you outline. I'll show you how you should have outlined because a lot of you guys don't know how to study for tests. You don't know how to read for content. What you'll do, since if the teacher gives you an article to read, or a novel to read, or whatever to read, or a textbook to read, you will do one of a couple of things. You will highlight everything. What's the point of that? If you're highlighting every other word or every other sentence, you know, then you may as well just read the whole chapter over again before the test. All right? I like to think that it's better to take notes to outline, to pick out the important information, okay? Um, so in, instead of just highlighting things, you tell me what you think I would want you to know from this chapter. Put it, obviously, the definition of nuclear fusion is going to be one thing you're going to have to have up there. But what else? What are some other things that tells you in those two pages you have to read on your own today? All right? And then answer these questions. All right? I'll write those down uh, right now somewhere. They're going to go in your homework section. You're not going to do them right there. They're not going to do them right there in your notes. I want you to do the notes separately. All right, and then do the homework. So next time I check it, that's where you'll start. And you'll have time when I'm done talking here to do this. You'll have plenty of time in this period to do it, I'm sure. Okay? All right. Now, by the way, I said there were two things I want to tell you about Chem 2. And this is an intro to Chem 2. All right, listen up. One is, every chapter I will do a section like this on your own, and I'll give you either a period or a half a period to do it on your own. The other thing is, at, at the end of every chapter in Chem 2, in the second half of the year, um, we will do some current topics in science, all right? And we'll do some, I'll give you an article, we'll see a video, we'll discuss it, we'll have, uh, and I'm going to start that with nuclear accidents, nuclear power accidents. I'm going to talk about how the nuclear power plants work tomorrow, and at the end of that, I'm going to have you investigate the three biggies, the three big nuclear power plant accidents that have happened in the past uh, 40 years. What are they? Chernobyl. Chernobyl. Three Mile Island and Fukushima. Those are the three biggies. All right, there are other incidences that we could talk about. I actually have one on wind scale. I'm going to talk, give you a little thing on that as well. But those are the biggies, all right, ones that everybody's heard about. And I'm going to have you guys... Look up stuff on that. I'm going to talk to you more about that tomorrow. That's another thing about Chem 2 that you know breaks up the chapters and um, makes it a little bit more interesting, perhaps, than Chem 1. And you're going to, I'm going to have the computers here will be starting tomorrow, and you're going to have them for the rest of the week. Uh, after end of each one of the things you look up, we're going to, I'm going to show you some stuff on my own, and you're going to basically uh, compare what you found out online to you know reality. And, and I'm purposely going to have you all choose, you're going to have to use a Google search, but do it at different pages. You're not going to all take the same ones. I know if I left you to your own devices, you would just take the first Wikipedia site that comes up and get all your information from that. But I'm going to assign you sites. And that's really useful because it's going to show you how different the information is from an incident that happened 30, 40 years ago. There, you can still now find completely erroneous information, all right, out there, um, stuff that's, like, not even close, and uh, that's one of the reasons I do this, I, I, I call, call it myth busting, all right, so start on these right now.